When the entire framework of how we're going to deal with violence against women or domestic violence is about um, criminalizing people, folks who are in communities that don't trust the police, that are targeted for immigration enforcement, that know that if they call the police they're likely to be harmed themselves or their family or community is likely to be harmed, all those people aren't going to feel connected to those services, aren't going to be able to avail themselves of them. Immigrant survivors of violence, often new immigrants um, to, the, to the U.S. who come uh, to their organizations for services um, don't want to have any interaction with the criminal legal system. So they don't want to call the police. They don't want to go through a criminal legal process to get um, any kind of safety um, mechanism like a criminal restraining order because there are risks for them and their communities if um, in those interfaces. So especially because of the increased relationship between the criminal legal system and immigration enforcement, um, any contact with the criminal legal system exposes them to a whole new set of risks. There's been the creation of these um, immigration relief programs that require um, survivors to cooperate with prosecution in order to um, get immigration relief, right, in order to not be deported. And so um, literally you have to become um, uh, explicitly engaged in a, in a prosecutorial effort in order to get this relief. The impact of passing legislation to protect people actually just sets people up to experience further harm from police and prisons. So it was, we could, the, the path was so direct from the violence, um, violence against women movement to growing the prison industrial complex. We can see this sort of straight line, I think it, it just opened up this possibility for reevaluation because it was such a clear failure to so many of us who were involved in the 80s and 90s trying to make that change happen. We got this moment of wake up around, wow, more laws actually equals more violence in our lives. As the anti-violence movement professionalized and began to invest in and receive government funding, began to really see government and state and law enforcement specifically based responses as, as appropriate responses to violence rather than looking to each other in communities as both sources of immediate safety, sources of prevention, and sources of transformation. And so, the more people became invested in the government as the solution to violence and law enforcement particularly, the less they became willing to critique law enforcement or even to see law enforcement as a source of violence and the state as a source of violence um, that both directly and in, in the way that it responds to violence that happens in the community. When the Department of Justice started to kind of say, yes, with the Violence Against Women Act, et cetera, we're going to fund anti-violence programs, I mean, now many programs are almost entirely funded by the state. So you don't just have the contradictions of, you know, funding per se, but funding specifically by the state. Um, and so the result of that is many anti-violence programs, you know, are, are essentially operating as arms of the state. Um, the, the strategies that they've come up with to end domestic and sexual violence are all around, you know, longer prison sentences, more police involvement, you know, working closely with the criminal justice system, and not and hence are not an ability to address state violence at all. Um, and so many of the laws then that have been passed by the anti-violence movement end up getting used against survivors of violence. For instance, the mandatory arrest laws where batterers now just call the police first. So it's become uh, kind of this big industry, essentially. Instead of people being separated and both parties going through a healing process and the family and community sort of staying intact, Instead, what you have is communities being literally taken apart because one person that is so heavily penalized that they are incarcerated for years and years and years, sometimes the right person, sometimes the wrong person, sometimes they're both wrong, sometimes they're both right. It's just complex. These supposed solutions that are heavily funded and supported by the government and by, um, you know, a philanthropic, um, you know, community that feels great about cops and prosecution um, 
totally alienated from the uh, experiences of those facing the worst forms of violence. Looking at where the anti-violence movement is now in terms of uh, continuing to uh, you know, partner with the state in expanding criminalization, um, a lot of that I think is because of this kind of departure from, from uh, kind of radical really trying to get from the, to the roots of anti-violence to this non-profitization of anti-violence where the state is both a partner in funding and a partner in um, you know, addressing uh, domestic violence, and that's seen as a victory. Um, you know, and so, you know, I think the really interesting work is doing, being done by people who are pushing back against that and saying, you know, that this, you know, we, we've succeeded in having the cops take domestic violence seriously, but, you know, how much of that was due to the fact that criminalization was just expanding everywhere, and how much was that really a win for the movement, and how much of that is actually keeping our community safe, and how much of that is actually responding to the fact that the cops are the ones, you know, targeting queers of color, immigrants, et cetera. There isn't always a clear batterer. There isn't always someone who is solely responsible for what's happened. And the law is just too blunt an instrument for such a delicate and intimate thing as interpersonal violence and interrelationship um, violence.